Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's edition of It's a Peer-to-Peer -Peer World Virtual Conference. My name is Amanda Cole. I'm the Editor-in-Chief at Nonprofit Pro. I'm delighted to join you as MC for today's conference. The conference is brought to you by your hosts. They've come together to share their experience and knowledge with you today. We have expanded the conference this year and are including additional great sessions brought to you by our sponsors. This is the first year we expanded the conference to five days. When you registered for the main conference, you should have received login information for each of the 10 a.m. kickoff calls. And then from there, you can choose your own adventure by deciding what other sessions you wish to attend. Please note that if you did not register for one of the sessions available today and would like to attend, visit peertopeerworld.com and register for the session to receive a unique link to attend that session. If a session is not on your calendar and you don't receive an email prior, an hour prior to the start time, then just please double check that you are actually registered for the session or activity. Peer to Peer World is back for its fourth straight, for its fourth straight Friday of peer to peer content, including uh, the fourth installment of peer-to-peer -peer email communications workshop, which is covering copy design and deliverability today at 1130. This afternoon, don't miss DIY Mythbusters at one. Participate in a virtual walk at two and discover how thanking your donors can double your acquisition at 230. And finally, there will be a panel on the new era of P2P events at four. And as an attendee, don't forget to log on to peer2peerworld.com slash voices to introduce, your, introduce yourself and provide your thoughts. Next slide. Mm -hmm. um, a few housekeeping notes. We are recording the session, so it will be available to review afterwards. Please be sure to post your questions in the Q&A area throughout the presentation. We'll address those at, during the session. Um, and we may answer some in the chat to look out for that as well. And finally, please complete the survey at the end of the next session for your chance to win some swag from our friends at Halo. This session is entitled, Hybrid is here to stay, time to blueprint P2P events for a new world. Here with me today is Jessica Dean, the head of Team Sierra for the Sierra Club, and Colleen Fitzgerald, managing partner at OP3, which will explain how to plan for events despite the uncertain future of in-person events and how to develop a new quality program, new quality programming like Sierra Club's City Hike series. Again, during the sessions, feel free to submit any questions you may have. Through the questions tab in your Zoom control panel, Jessica and Colleen will answer those toward the end of the session. The session is being recorded and will be made available after today's conference. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jessica and Colleen. Hey, Amanda, thanks so much for the warm welcome. Um, my name is Colleen Healy Fitzgerald, and I am one of the managing partners at Op3. For those of you who aren't familiar with us, Op3 is an event production and a peer-to-peer -peer fundraising consulting firm that specializes in both virtual and in-person event experiences. Over the past 19 years, we've had the opportunity to help our partners design and produce more than 350 events across the country and have raised more than $582 million. With me today is one of our very favorite client partners, Jessica Dean, who is the Associate Director at the Sierra Club in charge of Team Sierra. Jess has been working to launch Team Sierra's new signature event series. City Hike was an in-person urban group hike event, but has transformed into an immersive hybrid experience where participants use an app to follow a route, but also to learn and to be inspired by the Sierra Club. It is by far the most captivating hybrid event I've seen in action, and I think you'll be really blown away by the innovative mission engagement and the fundraising moments built right within the experience. Jess, how are you doing today? Hey, Colleen. I'm good. Excited to be here early in Portland, uh, Oregon, so I'll be caffeinating as, as we go. <laughs> oh, you know me. I don't shy away from caffeine. <laughs> <laughs> With four kids, I think my caffeine intake has increased a cup a day per child. So, um, so just to give you guys a brief overview of what to expect from today. First, we'll look at the data from 2020 and talk about why hybrid and virtual events are here to stay. But I really want to challenge people to start to think about hybrid and virtual in a new way. You know, at first, they were just kind of serving as a band-aid for in-person events in 2020 just as like a replacement for while we were all apart. But in the future, 
they're going to be they are going to start to be considered their own category, an entirely new revenue stream that organizations should be investing in and cultivating. A virtual or a hybrid event will be a key way to diversify every organization's fundraising portfolio. Now, this might be hard for you to imagine right now, especially if you haven't gotten great results from your current options, but the potential is there. And now is the time to start trying new things and to start investing in developing quality program, quality programming specifically designed for that user experience. I know how hard it is to introduce something new, even internally, let alone to market, which is why we're gonna spend the majority of our time today talking through the process of how the Sierra Club did exactly this. They created a really mission engaging and forward thinking hybrid experience this year in 2021. Their reimagined city hike will be so much more than just a beautiful hike and a cool after party. The new hybrid event will have an immersive experience that allows their participants to see the impact that the Sierra Club is making in their city and also in the world. It's gonna be the chance for their participants to see their own city with new eyes. And we're gonna utilize the time of the event to number one, teach the participants more about the Sierra Club and its amazing work. Two, give participants the opportunity to share everything that they're learning in a social media friendly format. And three, lay the groundwork for this just to be the first of many engagements with the club. The Sierra Club City Hike is on to something really great. And today we're gonna to talk about everything um, from the event origins to the concepting process to the execution this fall. We will save some time at the end to talk through questions and comments, but please feel free to use this hour together to engage with each other via chat and share ideas. Um, I'm gonna kind of stay off chat until the end, but I am looking forward to reading it. So, all right, we will get started. So first, looking at, you know, let's just take a look at what we learned in 2020. 2020 showed us that virtual events can be a powerful fundraising opportunity with undeniable benefits. The biggest benefit is access to a huge new pool of, of potential participants. Before, most organizations focused their peer-to-peer -peer efforts around markets that could physically take part in their events. With virtual, the world is your oyster, and organizations are using this opportunity to increase their pools of potential people interested in their event. In the Sierra Club City Hike, you'll find that 85% of people are utilizing the virtual option, despite having the option of two physical events on the ground. Another benefit of hybrid is the chance for year-round engagement that is not weather contingent, unlike outdoor events, which I know is gonna ring true for anyone here in the Midwest with me. Hybrid also offers an inclusive option for anyone with physical limitations or even just a busy schedule that can't actually join you during a specific scheduled time. And finally, virtual events often have lower infrastructure costs than in-person events. So even if you don't raise as much, if your costs are significantly less, it is definitely still worth it. So before we dive in deeper, I just wanna hear from everyone you know, attending today's conference. Is your organization planning to provide a virtual or hybrid option? Uh, Mark, I'll have you run our poll. Um, so if you guys could just take a second and let, let us know what your organization is planning on doing. You know, it's interesting, in a survey we helped conduct this spring, already more than 85% of organizations surveyed said that they wanted to continue to offer a virtual participation option in the future. So it looks like, Mark, do you want to publish these results? It looks like things have kind of evened out. So it looks like here today, you know, we've got about 60% saying yes, of course, 34% um, saying maybe you're on the fence, and 8% saying no, I was hoping virtual disappeared. And if you would have asked me a year ago, I would have been on that team, but I am changing my tune. And I hope that, um, you know, by the name of my session. Uh, hopefully I will convert everyone into feeling the same way by the end of today. Okay, Mark, let me get rid of this poll. Okay, great. Well, thank you for sharing. So last year, participation in the top 30 peer-to-peer -peer programs dropped by nearly two thirds if you were looking at the sheer quantity of number of participants. 
In 2019, 6 million people took part in these events. And in 2020, it was just 2.2 million. This would be a really depressing statistic, except for the fact that those who remained were so much more engaged in fundraising. The average raise per participant increased 83% from 2019 to 2020. This is amazing. And to me, this really shows us that people still cared about the mission of these organizations, even with all the sometimes bumpy new virtual formats, and even in the face of uncertainty and really challenging circumstances in their personal lives. This shows that when people care about your mission, they are open to evolving how they interact with foundations. And really, we should view 2020 as an amazing triumph for a lot of people in our, in our industry. It is really hard and scary to pivot and move away from the fundraising model you've used in the past, but people tried new things and got it done and still raised a significant amount of money last year. So virtual and hybrid events really have an infinite amount of engagement possibilities. There are so many different formats happening right now, but the two most common ones um, are definitely these two. So the first would be to offer a virtual option for an in-person event and saying that their participants can still run, walk, fly kites, do yoga, whatever at home and still fundraise. And then the second most popular peer-to-peer -peer fundraising virtual engagement was having participants watch a mission engaging ceremony on Facebook or YouTube or a website or whatever. To me, if you're if you're going back to hosting a physical event, you know, offering these two on top of that it is a no brainer decision. Of course, this takes very little time and effort. But what I really wanna stress is that if you're limiting your virtual engagement to only these two, you are really missing the boat. It's like a lackluster DIY program. If you invest very little into your virtual participation options, you are likely gonna get very little out of it. You know, 2020, it's really just one thing. I think people felt bad for a lot of organizations. Your participants literally had no other plans. So they might've watched your program or kept their family tradition of walking on the normal day. But I think people are seeing in 2021 and definitely next year, you know, they're gonna need more than this to come back. So, I mean, I think, let's just face it, a lot of virtual events fell flat. They felt like they were just filling in a gap until we could be back in person. But the real takeaway of 2020 is that virtual and hybrid fundraising models have proven themselves to work. We've seen the potential and we cannot put Pandora back into the box. The economic disruption COVID brought to our industry really highlighted the strong need for every organization to start diversifying their event portfolio. We've learned over the last 18 months that you can't always depend on just in-person fundraising events to fulfill your organization's needs. So you have to start planning for alternatives. So that being said, in order for these alternatives to work, we need to start concepting and executing events that are meant to be done in a virtual or a hybrid format. Most virtual events right now are kind of like a square peg in a round hole. It's like we try to fit an old shirt on a new body, but it looks and it feels terrible because it wasn't designed for this experience. We need to imagine new styles of events for the new world. So as someone who's built an entire career <laughs> from being really good at producing in-person events, this was a tough pill for me to swallow. You know, it was hard for me to face this new reality. And I think, you know, for a while, we were all just collectively hoping that things would get back to normal. But it's time to face facts. Even this fall doesn't look like how any of us wanted. But here we are. I think a lot of people know that they need to be, that they need to start doing something new in a digital space. But it's hard. And nobody likes change because it's messy and complicated but it's what we have to do to ensure our organizations can keep bringing in those donor dollars. I don't know how many people here have gotten hooked on Ted Lasso yet. Hopefully I'll see those comments by it, <laughs> but it is a really delightful show that can be inspiring for anyone who's taking on a new challenge or trying to reimagine themselves in this new reality. And for me, this quote really hit me as being applicable to our industry right now. It is uncomfortable to try new things, and that's okay. 
but it's what we have to do to rise to this challenge. So we're about to dive into our case study, but before we do, I just want to take a second to make sure I've given my own little PSA about studying other events. Um, first and foremost, I love studying events. I love seeing what people are doing. I find so much energy by looking at other events and I look everywhere for, for inspiration. And I'm always trying to bring the most innovative ideas back to our clients all the time. But when you're studying other events, really try to focus on the process of how they found success rather than just the specific product that worked for them in their event. I invited Jess to talk about this new style of event today because she has just gone through the reconcepting process. And I think she could share some really valuable insights, but we are going to spend a ton of time talking about the process rather than just show off her very cool new product um, so that you can learn how you can do it too. The Sierra Club is building the bones of an event really that doesn't look anything like I've experienced before. The experience feels incredibly authentic to their mission because it was designed for them. If you're using it as your inspiration, think about the concept, the intention, and the design that led to this model, rather than just trying to copy the product so that your ideas feel authentic to your organization. All right, now for the good stuff. Uh, let's talk about City Hike. So Jess, hey, welcome. Thank you so much for being here with us today. I know it is really early in Portland. Um, and this is also wild timing for you as we are mid-event right now. City Hike is happening over a three-week period and we're about 12 days in. How are you feeling about everything? What has been the early response to the new concept? Yeah, I've been feeling really good. Um, before the event actually started, we've had 475 registrations with almost $30,000 raised. And now that we're mid-event, we have over a thousand registrations and have we've raised almost eighty thousand uh, dollars, which is more than double what we raised in 2019 with ten times as many registrations. So super exciting. Um, and initially, I had anticipated that LA and Boston would have a higher number of registrations and engagement rates since there are flagship events with official routes. But our national event is far and away getting more regist registrants and raising more money which lends itself to the point that you had made earlier about um, having access to a larger pool of po potential participants when recruiting. I think all of it is so fascinating and I can't wait till this event is over so that we can start diving into the day. <laughs> uh, you know, before we dive in further though, um, can you just take a second and tell everybody a little bit about the Sierra Club's mission because it really ties into the event experience. Yes. So we're an old organization. We have been around since 1892, which has given us a lot of time to evolve. Um, and typically when people think of the Sierra Club, they think of land conservation and hiking, and that's what we've built our legacy on. Uh, but in the last couple of decades, the Sierra Club's done a lot of work on retiring coal plants to help move away from fossil fuels and transitioning to clean energy and really working on solutions for the climate crisis. And we do this through our national initiatives, but we also have a huge grassroots network with 64 chapters and millions of members across the country who lead the way with local initiatives. So as a part of this event, we wanted the idea of caring for the environment to translate not just to the parks that you visit, but also to the places that you live. So in LA, for instance, there's so many parks and trails that people can access to get nearby nature. And so we wanted to highlight that access through different routes throughout the city while also talking about important local issues like the air quality in LA and the need for clean air initiatives. So City Hike raises money both for national initiatives and also for our local initiatives. It's so cool. Um, as the head of Team Sierra, you have been working to launch a signature event series since you were hired and you finally got to have your you know, first City Hike in 2019. Can you tell everyone a little bit about the proof of concept launch? Yes, uh, 2016 sounds so long away and far away. Um, when my team initially started talking about the signature event, we knew we wanted something that was mission aligned, um, outdoors, active, with, with fairly straightforward logistics. And we really liked the idea of a 5K, but it didn't seem like the perfect fit for our audience. So we sent out a survey with a few concepts to past participants and donors to Team Sierra. And the city hike option was by far the most popular vote. And so we chose LA as our pilot city because we had a very strong chapter 
Um, they had very robust outings program and volunteer base, and we really needed to lean on our volunteers to help put on the logistics of the first event. And it took place in downtown LA. We had two hiking um, distant options, and the event ended with a rooftop party, which was actually right above, it was the building where the chapter office was. Um, the event had a zero waste focus and we created upcycled t-shirts. We gave out clean canteen reusable water bottles so people could fill up as they were hiking. We had a solar DJ, which was one of my favorite things. Didn't know that existed before this event. Um, we served food at the after party on corn husks and we partnered with All Trails to help us create a custom route on their app that guided people through iconic urban parks and trails. The part that I think was the biggest success was that the majority of people who participated in the, in the event were first timers to Sierra Club and they were motivated by a city specific mission for clean air and a new type of event. I mean, I thought it was a cool concept even then. I had never even heard of an upcycle t-shirt, but I love seeing it. And there's a picture there if you guys want to check it out. But um, just to add a little context, we got to start working together in 2019 a lifetime ago, in preparation for what should have been the 2020 event. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the first hike in LA was very grassroots. Um, we had about 25 volunteers and staff members who were up at the crack of dawn, setting up on the rooftop of the building where I mentioned the LA chapter office is. So I knew if I wanted to scale the event that I would need to bring in the professionals at three. Um, so we started working with you on fundraising and recruitment campaigns for the original hike, uh, the hike event concept and to produce the physical event that we had been planning at the time to have in Denver and LA in 2020. And then COVID. COVID. So, yeah, everybody knows that story. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so let's fast forward to planning for 2021 right now. So what were your goals when we started for the 2021 event experience? Yeah, in March of uh, 2021, we decided that we were going to move forward with our plans to produce City Hike as a hybrid event. Um, we decided to have a physical route in two major cities, which LA and Boston, um, an all virtual option for people who lived outside of those two chosen cities. And because of COVID, we knew that our initial goals for this event would have to change. Um, we decided to make the hike self or app directed with no staff or supplies on site. And rather than doing it on one day, we decided to do it over a few weeks so people had flexibility with scheduling and weather, but we still wanted a very specific window of time to create a sense of urgency to actually do the event. Uh, we also knew that because so much time had lapsed since the first event that we needed to set our expectations for recruitment and participation and view this as another first year proof of concept event. Definitely. So how did the reimagining of the concept process go? Well, we spent a lot of time working <laughs> with you and thinking about the experience of the participants. Um, what did we want them to actually do and feel on the event? What did we want the fundraising model to look like? How did we want to engage business partners this time around? And this is what we identified. Uh, we felt like a hike was different from a 5K or walk because of the sense of adventure or the idea of learning something new as a part of the experience. We're trying to utilize this event as a gateway for a younger and more diverse population and wanted to build excitement through an engaging new experience. And we knew we wanted the mission to be at the forefront of the experience to make it stand out. And we wanted to help each local chapter be really involved in the process. So we actually chose our test cities based on chapter excitement levels. Um, and as part of the concepting process, our team at App3 worked with your team to define some really specific event goals and to, to blueprint the participant experience on the event. And to me, this is a really the most critical part of concepting. It helps bring focus to really all of your decisions, both in the moment and then also in the future. And it helps make sure all the key stakeholders are on the same page about the goals of the event and what we're trying to create, which is interesting that you'll find different people will have different visions, even if you're using the same words to describe an event. So this helps us get into a lot, you know, a, a bigger detail. So we built this concept in early 2021, which it should be noted was a time of really great uncertainty in our industry. We didn't know who would have access to vaccines when, 
We didn't know what the mass gathering laws would be in the fall. We knew we needed a participation option, no matter the COVID climate. We also knew we wanted the experience to feel powerful for the participants themselves during the event in the moment. But this experience is designed to go even further than that. It is designed to expand the reach of the inspiration points on the event and to use that inspiration to propagate further fundraising success via social media. While they were on the event, we wanted each participant to feel like they learned something new, that they understood the Sierra Club's impact in their areas, and we wanted them to feel further inspired to help you know, further the cause. And then this is a key part. So right in that exact moment, when they are inspired on the event, we wanted to make sure we were providing them with the tools they need and an explicit ask of what we wanted them to do next. So while the participants are inspired during the experience, we want them to be able to share everything they've seen and learned with their social networks. Sharing their inspiration will expand the power of the event exponentially and will inspire others to either donate or also get more involved with the Sierra Club. So Jess, how did your team use these goals? Because we're a national organization with grassroots power across the country, it's really important that we balance national mis mission messaging with chapter-led messaging. So we really uh, customize the message by doing a lot of audience segmentation because that's going what's going to motivate someone to join in LA is going to be very different than in Boston. Uh, the local component is critical for people's motivation and engagement. And the issues in Boston and LA are going to be completely different. So this is where it's critical for chapters to lead the direction and what they want to teach people about the places they live and how the Sierra Club is making an impact and what's the best way to engage people in this. Uh, how people are seeing the impacts varies greatly on where they live. So for this piece, I leaned very heavily on the chapters. In LA, for instance, they're dealing with more extreme wildfires, which impacts the air quality even more, as well as heat waves. So while both LA and Boston are working on similar initiatives, like clean energy plans across the city, the way they're seeing the impact and tackling the work looks a bit different. It's so interesting how, you know, having built all three apps, um, I, you know, we took the same concept and executed a little bit differently in each um, version. It's really cool to see. So this next slide is a marketing tool called AIDA. You know, conceptually, it's a tool, like it, it's a marketing model that traces a customer journey through awareness to interest, desire, action. Typically a company would use this to get someone to buy something, right? How do I get someone's attention, pique their interest, make them want it, and then actually get them to do it? You know, as part of the concepting, we use this, you know, a lot as an exercise. And we looked at it a little bit different for the Sierra Club experience. So we use the same exercise, but we put it in the context of someone who had already signed up for the event. As the Sierra Club was just building the series, we knew we didn't want to put up any high barriers to entry. The series is still brand new, so we wanted to pull in as many people to the experience as possible, but we also wanted to have a way to turn those interested people into fundraisers right from the get-go. You know, this approach lets us cast a wide net by making it easy to get people signed up to start their journey, but also laying the groundwork for the next steps. So Jess, Tell us why you think this is the right approach for people who have supported Team Sierra. Yeah, so one important thing to note that's unique about Team Sierra um, is we found that our group of donors are the most likely to give subsequent gifts over any other acquisition channel, meaning someone who donates to Team Sierra after being asked by someone in their network is very likely to continue donating and supporting the Sierra Club after the initial ask. So 65% of Team Sierra donors are first-time donors to the Sierra Club. So we're considering this event a gateway to a pipeline for new members. So like you had mentioned, we're building a lifelong relationship with our members and City Hike offers a transformational experience for new supporters and members. Uh, we still try to get people to fundraise before the event, uh, but we've really see, been utilizing the event to drive the revenue up by creating inspiration through the event and then using that spark to drive the fundraising push. And as you saw from the numbers I read off at the beginning, we've really seen people um, fundraising and signing up right when the event started and as the event has been going. That is so cool. And I think this is really a huge conceptual shift for a lot of people to wrap their head around. You know, most of the peer-to-peer -peer programs were concepted or created in a time 
when the ability to have participants fundraising on the event wasn't even a possibility. So most programs have the mindset that the fundraising push is all about before the event. And then the actual event is usually seen as like a celebration or, or just a chance to be together. But now the people have access to their entire networks in their hand while they're on your event, in the place where they're the most likely to be inspired and care about your cause. We really need to shift our mindset to utilize this moment to create a strong fundraising push and to make it easy for them. So after we define the event goals, the next step is choosing the medium for the hybrid experience. We spent a lot of time exploring different options for the event app. So again, at this point in early 2021, there was such huge advances in technology in our industry that had changed in the years since COVID began. So we really almost started over. We researched about 20 different apps. And the crazy thing was, spoiler alert, not one of them had exactly what we were looking for. So just for the sake of context and teaching people the process, what style of apps did you consider? We explored making it more scavenger hunty, um, making it like a walking tour or a podcast experience and having in-person physical challenges. And we looked at a lot of apps that are really built for fundraising and thought about how we could manipulate them for the event we wanted. Uh, there were a lot of ways this event could have gone, but picking the app style really would drive the participant experience. And at that time, we presented the top four options to your team at the Sierra Club. So how did your team make the decision? All had pros and cons, and this is where it's super helpful to be able to go back to the basics of what we wanted. Um, it's very easy to get lost in what one app can do or how sleek something is, but it really is all about whether or not it's driving the experience you want to create. Off three, literally, you guys created decision trees based around the event goals to help keep a clear picture of our goals aligned with what each app could do. So for example, this uh, slide right here is the pros and cons list for all trials, which was the app we used on the 2019 event. Mm -hmm. And as you can see here, there were a lot of different factors to think about. When you're picking a platform, really try to look past all the bells and whistles and the leaderboards and the points and all the elements that can seem so fun. Um, and instead of letting that drive your experience, try to think about the functionality of the experience you are trying to create, and then try to create your you know, pros and cons list, comparing the apples to apples regarding the functionality of each app. So as we kind of mentioned before, no app we found you know, checked all of our boxes. So we ended up building our own apps through a website called Glide, that allows you to utilize their templates to build really simple apps. Within the City Hike app, we also link to a live GPS enabled route through AllTrails, who is also a sponsor, but is also free. Um, so Jess, what made your team choose Glide? Well, first, because it's awesome. <laughs> and also, uh, it was a mix between our cost analysis and being able to stay focused on what we wanted the participants to feel and experience during the event. Uh, this format allowed us to create a unique experience that focused on the Sierra Club's impact both in LA and Boston, and also creating a more generic version that focuses on uh, our national agenda and our all virtual option. And so Glide is actually a browser that doesn't have, so I really like the experience that people didn't have to download something. We're already using all trials for the route, which is an app that people have to download. And so I felt like it made it an easier user experience for people. Definitely. So can you walk us through the app experience for your participants? Yeah. So when you open it up, you see the different points of interest for the event experience. And as you walk the route in each city, you learn about Sierra Club's initiatives and history and how you can see the work and real concrete examples along the route. Okay, I made a very fancy slide to showcase this. <laughs> so instead of just giving yourself, a, instead of just giving your participants a route, which is what you've done in the past, now you are giving them all of this additional information for each point of interest along the route. Mm -hmm. So when you click on each POI in the app, you now have an engaging experience where you can read about the history of the site, uh, see what the Sierra Club's impact is, watch a video of Sierra Club staff or a trusted volunteer discussing the same issue. 
And after we've educated and inspired the participants, we provide the opportunity for them to go a little further. We give them links to additional information in case they want to research further. And on top of that, we tell them how they can take action today on this exact issue. Uh, after that, we provide a unique social graphic for participants to share with their network and provide a place for commenting on this specific issue within the app. We also ask participants to share their pictures with us so their participation feels seen and we can use this information for live marketing on socials as well as our next events. And we provide an on-site challenge to further inspire their imagination about the issue. Yeah, what's really interesting is, you know, the Sierra Club tackles so many different, you know, issues within the climate crisis. And I thought it was so cool how you, you focus on different ones for each POI because it's like different issues will inspire different people. And this allows you to get something for everyone really. Um, so I know that was a lot of information <laughs> we just threw at you on my one very fancy slide. Um, so now Jess and I are gonna go into a little more detail about each piece of the puzzle here. So an important thing to note about the main content for each point of interest is that we use a teaching strategy here that gives people the same information, but in a few different ways. And each way will appeal to a different learning style. So a good example of this concept is the last time I went out to dinner, I parked my car in a large parking garage. And when I parked, I remember that we were on the second floor. My brother remembered the color orange, but my mom remembered that we were on the bear's floor. You know, it's this the same concept, but we give the information about each point of interest in a few different ways, the same information in a few different styles, with the hopes that we teach and inspire people in the way that they learn. So Jess, what does this look like within the City High Gap? Yeah, and I'm always the person who just takes a picture of where I parked to remember. <laughs> <laughs> I, we start each POI with a static picture and written description of the location and the Sierra Club's impact uh, in the area. For example, one POI in LA is in the Baldwin Hills Overlook. Uh, from this spot, you see the ocean, the amazing city skyline, but you also see the Playa del Rey gas storage facility. So we give more information about how this facility literally holds fracked gas and why the Sierra Club is working to shut this facility down. And in addition to the written description, we also had staff and important volunteers make videos or auto, auto re, audio recordings of the same information so that you can see or hear the information straight from a trusted source. The Boston, Boston team wanted to try a podcast style audio recording and we we're trying a different style in each market, but the key here is providing access to the information in a written visual and auditory format. Yeah, and the Baldwin Hills, so that hike is pretty common in LA, but I think it's amazing that you, you took a, a common hike, but then you're showing them something they probably have never known about the area. I think it's really, really cool and amazing. Mm -hmm. So as a participant at this point, I'm walking along this amazing route and I learned something new and I was totally inspired by the information um, provided at the top of the app. So where do we go from here? Yeah, this is where we give them more details and access to data in a raw form. On each POI, we provide a place where participants can take action and learn more. So for example, instead of just talking about public transit issues, this is where we provide a link to a trusted partner who can verify the issues and provide additional context for the participants. We also give them a way to help that day in a concrete manner, whether it's signing an online petition or joining a committee that focuses on the issue. Uh, it's really a matter of capitalizing on their interest to create further engagement. You know, and also just providing access to additional information is the shift that, that a lot of organizations are going to have to make to appeal to the younger generation of donors. You know, the younger donors have grown up with a phone in their hand and they know how to Google and do their own research. Older generations never had such easy access to such a massive amount of information. You know, people used to donate to foundations that just had a good reputation, but these Gen Z kids expect way more than that. They want to be able to see exactly where their funds are going, and they want to see concrete specifics of it, you know, where they live. Giving your participants access to the specifics of your work will further their trust in your organization and will make them care way more. So, for example, in one of the Boston POIs, Instead of just saying the Sierra Club is fighting for climate change, you know, which just seems so generalized, it's true, but it's it's hard to wrap your head around what are they actually doing? In the link, you know, we actually link to a hugely important bill the Sierra Club 
helped pass through the state legislature this year. This shows the event participants how the larger, sometimes seemingly impossible goals of the foundation can actually happen. And here is the impact where they live this year. This ties into Jess's vision of creating an event that will appeal to a younger generation. So, and next, we wanna get each person sharing on the event because we want them to be sharing their inspiration with their networks and fundraising along the way. So we also wanna provide a way for participants to engage with the Sierra Club and with each other while they were in the app, even if they're doing the event alone, you know, along the way. So Jess, can you describe that? Yeah, we created a button where participants can share their photos directly with us so we can share them with the world. Um, we think this provides them the opportunity to interact with us, even if we're not physically on the event with them. And we also created a place for comments on each POI, so you can comment and create a dialogue on any of the specific issues that, that call to you. Cool. So, and now the push for social outreach during the event. So Jess, can you walk us through this? Yeah, so on the slide, you'll see a social square that we created that looks good for people to share on their social media accounts. And it has a, a teaser of information for that POI. And there's a unique one created for each point. The idea is that some issues or POIs will appeal, appeal to certain people and likely their networks as well. And we've all seen the power of fundraising on social media. So this reduces the work for the participants and it lets them share in a simple way. Uh, we give them explicit instructions to share any and all of the information they learned on the route. And we also pre-write an email that contains a link to ask for a donation. And since it's a three-week event, we also hope that sharing on social might inspire somebody in their network to actually sign up and participate in the event themselves. That's awesome. And then one more cleanup push at the end. So the final part of this app experience is the Sierra Club tab at the bottom right. And this is just the simplest reminder of the work that the organization is doing and then the concrete ways they can help today. So what are those ways, Jess? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they can donate. <laughs> they can ask their <laughs> network to donate. Um, they can also sign up for a volunteering opportunity, supporting political initiatives and continuing to support this year club's event. And it sounds really simple, but it's a roadmap to continued success. Um, these opportunities were always there, but our theory is that people will take that step if it's presented while they feel inspired, instead of asking them to care after the event. Totally. After they re-enter the real world, you got to capitalize on their excitement there. It's so cool. But um, before we wrap up, I just want to review the original event goals, right? Hike, get inspired, share, fundraise, and show how these concepts came to life during this experience. So. Now that we've pushed through the really hard part of creating a new style of event, I am so excited watching this event come to life. And further, I can't wait to see how it'll evolve in the future. It, hybrid is here to stay, but digital events don't have to feel so boring and uninspired. What we've seen over the last 18 months is that the companies and the people that are thriving are the ones that are adapting and evolving, even if that process feels painful at times. Now is the time to create new event concepts built for the new world. And City Hike is showing us it is really possible to create something great. You just have to be open to doing the work. Okay, Jess, I have one more question about City Hike. After this season, where do you see the future of the City Hike series? Yeah, I think there's so much opportunity to create partnerships that really help to scale the event and create engagement throughout the route. Uh, you had presented some really fun ideas for the future, like having a sponsor put in an art installation along the route for a period of time that would both promote the event and also create an engagement point for people during the event. And I really, I really love that. Uh, the goal is really to continue to add more cities year over year. So it grows a grassroots following and becomes a signature event for the climate crisis. We're talking about doing Seattle event next year. Um, I'd also love to see Oakland where our headquarters is and some Midwestern representation in Chicago or Madison. Well, you know I'm rooting for Chicago, but yeah. <laughs> um, and before we go, I really wanted to invite everyone at home to experience these apps for yourself by signing up for City Hike today. It's a two for one. You can fight for climate change and experience the coolest new you know, hybrid app 
in town. So um, you can register at the URL you see on the screen and we will put a link to it in the comments as well. Um, does anyone have any questions for us? All right, so I encourage everyone to throw some questions down in the Q&A tab. But while we're waiting for those to come in, I jotted down some notes just to, to fill any space. So I, I want I really that 83% that you mentioned at the beginning, Colleen, really stood out to me. That's amazing to get 83% um, higher engagement on these events. But I'm curious because I know sometimes the there's some heavy lifters on these peer-to-peer -peer events. So I'm, I'm curious, did it kind of redistribute that that fundraising where like you're getting more people joining for the cause and not so much the event was there did that happen as well so i'm gonna kick that over to jess but the hard part is we're mid you know launch right now so I, we don't have all the data but i'll let jess answer what she's seeing so far yeah typically what we do after the event is we send out a survey um, with those types of questions asking people what motivated them to join and then we collect all the um, all the data and look at it at that point. So I don't know that I could give like a great answer on that yet, but probably in a couple of weeks I could. <laughs> okay, okay, perfect. <laughs> we did have a question just come in asking if you're charging any registration for the event or are you relying on donations from participants and supporters? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for that question, Susie. So we are charging a $35 um, registration donation is what we call it. And we actually started testing this year, allowing people to participate by registering only um, without fundraising. And then if they wanted to fundraise, they were eligible to earn different incentives like the upcycled t-shirt, um, a be prepared box for the event, and then an, what we call an ultimate grand prize. It's only, uh, only 10 people can get, which has like this really cool tent, um, a gift card to some of our outings or lodges that people can stay in. And the reason we started doing this is um, because as I mentioned before, a lot of people, Team Sierra is a point of entry for them at this to the Sierra Club where they then later engage and make donations. So we wanted to make it really easy. We didn't want to deter people by having to have a fundraising minimum. Um, and we, we felt like it was really opening up more people. When we did it in 2019, we had taken a survey after the event about the fundraising model and people had um, really been interested in the fundraising with incentives um, and also being able to join with just a registration fee. And so, yeah, hope that it answers your question. Perfect. And if there's any more questions, drop them in the Q&A. We still have a few more minutes. Um, do you guys see anything in terms of, you mentioned the flexibility, have you guys seen anything in terms of impact by giving people the option of not doing an event on a set day, but have, being able to do it on their own time? Yeah, so some people are doing, because the Boston hike is a little over eight miles, and the LA hike is, I think, about five and a half miles, but it's an out, it's an out and back, and so some people um, have been doing just part of the hike in one day, or little segments of it. And I think that that um, really helps. And one idea that I thought would be cool for the future is each year we're going to be adding new routes. So that could give with three weeks, people who haven't participated in the past could then do multiple routes throughout the city um, during that time and really make it, you know, a whole, a whole thing. Perfect, perfect. Well, I'm not seeing any more questions coming in um, the q and Is there anything else you guys wanna touch on before we wrap up? No, I mean, I'll just leave my contact information right here. Um, if anybody wants to talk more about hybrid events or Ted Lasso, I do have a, a very personal connection. Uh, so I have a fun fact I can share if anyone cares. But um, yeah, I would love to uh, talk to anyone if they want to explore creating, you know, a hybrid event of their own. But that's great. I'll let you, you know, take it back to the rest of the conference too. All right. Perfect. Well, I just want to remind everyone just to not forget to complete the brief survey for a chance to win some cool prizes. That's the end of our session for today. Thank you so much to both Colleen and Jessica for all this great insight. Um, and thanks to our attendees for joining. Please note that if you will be attending the next session, the P2P email communications workshop, you will need to log in using that um, unique link you received when you registered. Have a good day, everyone.